Good morning, church. Turn in with me in your Bibles to Joel chapter 2. We're going to be in verses 1 through 17 this morning. Um, I actually found a very interesting video my wife actually had showed me last night. Um, and it was kind of curious and made me think. It was of an Orthodox Jewish woman uh, kind of explaining a little bit of her life and how as, as an Orthodox Jew they do certain things. And, and one of the things is they, they hold in very high regard the Sabbath. It's one thing that, as my wife and I have actually talked, that is actually very impressive about the Orthodox Jewish people and, and their faith, the, the high view that they have for God, which I think a lot of times is lacking in, in our own lives. Now, obviously, there is a point where that can become a, a, an issue of tension because we now tip over into legalism, and you see a lot of this even today. I know we talked about it prior um, while we were in Colossians about the, uh, I shared kind of how the Pharisees would kind of skirt their way around on the Sabbath in order to avoid uh, the law that said they could only travel one mile from their place of dwelling. They would the day before go and drop like some clothes at a rock about a mile from their home and they'd go on further if they needed to make a trip to another. That way, as they're traveling, they're always technically one mile within a dwelling place of theirs because they have things residing at certain areas like a rock here and a tree over there and, and that would allow them to kind of skirt through the system. And it was interesting because even in this video you see that kind of happening even today. So in Exodus 35, 3 it says this, you shall kindle no fire in all your dwelling places on the Sabbath day. And what I found interesting was this is now translated over into the modern day. And so this Orthodox Jewish woman was sharing, she said, on the Sabbath, which would be uh, that, that Friday night at sundown until the following night on Saturday at sundown, that would be their, their Shabbat, their Sabbath that they celebrate. They are not permitted to turn on electricity, which means they can't flip on a light switch. So if they wanted to have light in their home at all on the Sabbath, what they would have to do is the day before they would turn the lights on. Now that causes an issue because now what happens when you're ready to go to bed? You can't turn it off because it's the Sabbath day and you're not allowed to do any work on the Sabbath day. And, and the, the, the relation to this was that starting a fire was the same as turning on electricity because there was a spark, an ignition of something that would bring light. And so instead, what they have developed is this, this lamp that you could click and turn on, and it had a tube on the inside that you could rotate. And so when you wanted the light off, you would rotate the tube, and it would cover the little lens that was on the front, and it would shield the light, thus turning it off and darken the room without you actually having to turn the electricity off. And I watched this video, and my first initial response was, I am so thankful that Jesus has set me free from having to live that kind of life. To not be able to turn on, because then it had a bunch of other questions that brought to mind. What, what if you, does it mean that you can't turn on the TV, you can't watch TV on the Sabbath? And what happens if you press the, the power button on your phone to turn the screen on? Next thing you know, it's, ah, I've just messed up. Right? And so this causes all kinds of problems. So my, my first thought was, I'm so glad that Christ has set us free from the legalism of that system but my second thought made me consider my own shortcomings. Where, where I too go through the motions of the Christian life oftentimes in the same way that they had such a strict, regimented way that they would have to do things. And again, if you missed something before the Sabbath, then you were without it on the Sabbath day or else it was a sin. And then you have to go into all these sacrifices that have to be given as well. And I thought though, that oftentimes I find myself as well going through the rituals of the Christian life without actually giving it any true thought. And so yes, while it is not this issue of legalism that I'm falling into, I fall into this, this almost antinomianism, which is just a way of saying that, that there's almost no adherence or no real attention to the law of God. And I do these things without considering the importance of who it is that I'm serving and how often I take God's warnings and his commands for granted. And I know that I'm not alone on that because I'm sure each and every one of you have probably experienced this in your life as well. So we're going to be in Joel chapter 2 as we look at Joel's call to the Jewish people. So if you wouldn't mind standing with me this morning as we read out of respect and reverence for the word of God. Joel 
Joel writes this, Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their, their like has never been before, nor will be again after them through all the years of all generations. Fire devours before them, and behind them a great flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but behind them a desolate wilderness, and nothing escapes them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like war horses they run. As with the rumbling of chariots they leap on the tops of mountains, like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, peoples are in anguish, all faces grow pale. Like warriors they charge, like soldiers they scale the wall. They march each his own way, they do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another, each marches in his path and they burst through the weapons and they are not halted. They leap upon the city, they run up upon the walls, they climb up into the houses, they enter through the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble. The sun and moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride in her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach and byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? Father, as we look this morning at this passage, God, I pray that the, the call to the present danger would be considered in the context of of Israel here, but also in the context of our own lives, that the calamity that befalls us is meant to be a kind warning that comes before even greater destruction. God, I pray as we look and as we reflect on our own lives, that we would not separate ourselves entirely from this text and its application, but Lord, we would take into consideration the powerful truths that we find within it. Lord, we are so grateful that you are a loving and merciful God, that you relent over disaster. And God, I pray that we would consider our own lives as we look at this text this morning. God, we thank you for your goodness. We ask that you would open our hearts, that you would cease all distractions, and that you would clear our minds so that we may see and hear what it is that you have for us this morning. We pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen. You may be seated. The first thing that we see here in the second chapter of Joel is that Joel creates or or gives a call to preparation. He starts off with saying, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. The the trumpet was, was meant to be a symbol of a signal of warning. And so whenever you see in scripture trumpets being blared, it was a warning most often. Either that an enemy was approaching or that something was about to happen or whatever the case was. And so here we see 
uh, this, this blowing of this trumpet in Zion. And Zion was the name that was used synonymously with the city of God, that is Jerusalem. Right? It, is, it is referencing right, which the, the city of God, Jerusalem, being within the nation of Judah, actually, which is who Joel is directing this uh, warning to, and it means fortification, And so oftentimes you see all throughout the Old Testament, especially in a lot of the poetry and Psalms and things like that, this this idea, and even when you get into Revelation, this idea of Jerusalem kind of being the the safe haven, the fortification which people were to flee to. And then other times in Scripture you see things where, where the call is actually to flee from that and to run into the mountains because the fortification of Jerusalem is is not enough to protect the people. And so this was a dire call that Joel was making. He said, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. Now the day of the Lord was often understood as a day of judgment of God's enemies. We talked about this too, even last week as we discussed the day of the Lord as it was coming. And oftentimes, uh, even Amos called people to this, because when the Jewish people heard of the day of the Lord, they thought a day of victory. That was their response. It was, it was a day of excitement for them because it meant that God was coming to judge the enemies of Israel and to judge his enemies that were against him. But here in Joel, as well as it was in the book of Amos, it is not regarded in this sense as a day of rejoicing. There may be a mistake a mistaken idea here from the Jewish people saying, yes, we're, we're rejoicing because the day of the Lord is drawing near and Joel is saying, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. It's not a day of rejoicing, but of agony, since in this case, Judah was standing in the place of God's enemy. This was the fearful reality for many even today. Many today, even in churches, would rejoice and say the day of the Lord is coming. We we can't wait until the Lord comes to exact his vengeance on his enemies. And I get this, this picture of them just standing there as this wave of, of God's vengeance or whatever is coming for the enemies and they realize in that moment that's directly headed towards me. And I imagine how terrifying it will be on that day for so many who have believed that they were on God's side only to find out that this day of the Lord that they longed for and looked for so much was not a day of rejoicing for them, but rather of great agony and fear. Because while they rejoice at the coming of the Lord to bring judgment to a wicked world, they don't understand that they too will be caught in the wake of his wrath because they too are unregenerate. Do not be deceived, church. This is why Paul calls so often in in all of his letters in the New Testament to evaluate Because you don't want to find yourself deceiving yourselves like the inhabitants of Judah did. Thinking the day of the Lord was going to be your victory when really it was going to be your demise. And so the coming threat of an even greater army is described in this first section here. In three different ways. By their appearance, by their operation, and by their effectiveness. And you can see, again, very much in in Hebrew prophecy and poetry and all of these things, there is an increasing uh, kind of, 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 of intensity to these things. Joel uses the imagery here to help people understand the seriousness and the importance of their situation. In fact, both locusts and armies are known to be the instruments of God's chastening. And while God's discipline is not pleasant, we know that it is good. It is purposeful. It is beneficial, in fact, for Judah, for Israel, for us. God only disciplines, and the reason why is because God only disciplines those who he loves. Only an unloving father would sit idly by while his children run straight into danger and disobedience that would lead to death. But that is not what God does. Nor has he ever done that for his people. But instead he leverages and he uses calamity in order to call his people to awake, call them to prepare and to understand 
The first thing that Joel goes into and we see here is the appearance of this great enemy that is coming, the, the locust, but even beyond that, this foretelling of a future army and future uh, group that would come in and lay waste to Judah. He describes it as a day of darkness and gloom filled with clouds of thick darkness. It's like a mighty army casting a shadow over the land, which has never been experienced in any generation nor would be experienced by any generation again. This picture from beauty in the Garden of Eden to desolation, this comparison between the two, as, as the Jewish people would have very much known the, the beauty of the Garden of Eden and everything that was given to them and given to Adam and Eve at the very beginning. And then you get this picture when they're cast out of the garden into what? Into the the dust of the wasteland and the thorns where, where Adam would have to toil and, and work in order to, to provide food from the ground, whereas in the garden, everything was in abundance and it was, it was, it was easily accessible. So there's this comparison of, of an Eden before this army and as they travel through a barren wilderness that is left behind in their wake. And nothing in the land would escape. Their appearance is like war horses, both in the sound of their approach and the fear that's invoked in the people. I don't know if you've ever had a horse run at you before, but they tend to be pretty big. Like normally you see a picture of a horse and you're just like, yeah, that's, you know, like a big dog or something. No, no. They're, they're normally the horse, a, a back of the horse would come up to probably about my head. Like if you've got a good sturdy one, like six foot, and then on top of that, you've got the rest of the horse. This thing is huge. Imagine if you had a whole lot of them running towards you. You're not getting out of the way. And this is the picture that is given like war horses. And the image of consuming everything like fire so that nothing was left behind but dust and ashes and waste. If that's not enough to be a terrifying picture of the the coming onslaught that would befall Judah, Joel goes, goes on to explain the operation. He describes the onrush of this oncoming army striking fear and like warriors they would charge He shares that in verse six, before them peoples are in anguish and all faces grow pale. Now I love history, I really do. Especially like war history. Um, And and documentaries are fascinating to me, especially when it's history and antiquity. Like ancient armies and things like that, it's really, really impressive. Well, one of the most feared armies, and time and time again, you will find this reiterated throughout history. One of the most feared armies of the ancient world were known as the Immortals. Has anyone heard of these, this, this army before? Right? If, you've ever, if you've ever studied or read up on like Sparta, like remember Leonidas in the 300, right? this would have been the army that they would have gone against. Now, the Immortals were a 10,000 strong fighting force and they were the most elite fighting force in the empire of Persia. They first actually appear in Herodotus, uh, Herodotus, who is a Greek chronicler, in his account of the Persian invasion of Greece. They're described as the best and the most magnificently equipped soldiers operating under the command of King Xerxes. In fact, according to Herodotus, the nickname Immortals came about because they always had the same number of troops. If a troop ever, or or if if a soldier ever died in battle or fell sick and would have to be left behind, another one would immediately take his place in the ranks so that they know they never had any more or any less than their 10,000 troops. And again, trained some of the most elite fighters in the entire world. And this was the, the fear, was that even if you were to take out some of their ranks, there would be more to replace them. They were invincible. Verse eight, Joel writes, they do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path and they burst through the weapons and are not halted. 
He speaks to the invincibility of their approach. Not just their onrush, but their invincibility. Nothing would stop them. They're bursting through the flanks. Oftentimes, you, when you go and you, you study that and you, you learn about Sparta and, and the way that they built their flanks to where each shield would co- cover and overlap the next person next to them, creating this, this almost impenetrable boundary, Joel says no amount of weapons will halt them. It would be like taking a bulldozer over a sandcastle. Overkill is, 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 is not enough to explain the severity of the invincibility of this coming army. Like a uniformed front line, they would be swift and thorough, not deviating, never breaking rank, undeterred by any weapon or blockade. So if their appearance was not enough to worry them, their invincibility, or at least the telling of their invincibility, should have been to the Jewish people. But Joel lastly speaks to their saturation. Leaping upon the city, scaling walls, entering houses. In fact, a lot of this, as I was reading that, kind of made me think back to the plagues of Egypt. If you go to Exodus 8.3, you see the, the telling of the, the second plague of frogs. It says this, The Nile shall swarm with frogs, and they shall come up into your house and into your bedroom, and on your bed, and into the houses of your servants, and your people, and into your ovens, and your kneading bowls, everywhere. It was a, I think it was the, the Jesus Storybook Bible, or whatever, I think we were remembering it, it, was talking about this event, right? In your pantry, frogs. In your oven, frogs. In your bathtub, frogs. In your bed, frogs, everywhere. And the same picture is found here in the saturation of this army as they flood through this city, getting into every crevice, into every household, through windows and and into rooms and households in almost like a massive wave as it traveled through. And any time they would hit a blockade, they would find a way around it to continue in their path going straight forward. This was the devastation that was going to befall Judah and the, the call to prepare for it that Joel had And lastly, we see the effectiveness, and this is probably the most terrifying of all of it. Because yes, the the appearance of this army was shocking. The warning of its invincibility in the face of of their, their, their running through the city was terrifying. But I think even more so is the effectiveness that we find here. Verse 11 says this, the Lord utters his voice before his army for his camp is exceedingly great he who executes his word is powerful you see the the concern here whose army is it that's coming to destroy judah it's the lord's you want to talk about effectiveness Talk about the God who never fails at what he sets his mind to do. The army was guaranteed success for one reason and one reason alone. Their commander was the sovereign God himself. Forget about the appearance of the war horses. Forget about the the picture of the invincibility. The simple fact that their commanding officer was the Lord God Almighty should have been enough to strike fear into the hearts of every man, woman, and child in Judah. And with these accompanying signs, who would dare stand before the Almighty to endure the force of his wrath? So Joel's call is very clear. Be prepared. But he continues into our second point here. There is a call to return. And I love this because, again, you, whenever you see this in Scripture, it is so incredible to look at the, the fear that should be here because of all of these things that were described of this coming army and everything else, and it's terrible that, that God himself is bringing this wrathful army to destroy everything. And then what does it say in verse 12? Yet even now. That word, yet, in Hebrew, can also be translated but. 
And you find that word even in the New Testament a lot, but God. That's such a beautiful thing. When you see that in Scripture, it should cause your heart to just leap with joy because this is God speaking here. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. They've just been given a picture of everything that is going to come and and the terror that should be striking their hearts and God says, but wait, return to me. After all of this, God breaks the discouraging timeline and instead he capitalizes on tragedies that befall mankind. And the word that's used here for, for turn or return are the same in the Hebrew word. It means to turn back meaning that they were at one point going in the direction that they should have been, but they got turned around. So God here calls his people to repentance. And there's given here in in the text an, an external and an internal call here. Joel mentions fasting and weeping and mourning. These were external signs of grieving over sin, and, and most times it could be done as show. It's very easy to put on a face and act like things are, that that you're grieved over something. We can put on the mask most times and do that really well. In fact, he talks about rending your garments, tearing one's shirt or their coat or their their clothing or whatever was was a sign in in the Jewish culture and really in in most culture in that time of, of this deep grieving that would happen. It was a way of showing mourning during tragedy or a time of great sin. But what is said there? In verse 13, rend your hearts and not your garments. It does nothing to just tear your clothes and say, well, done. I mourned correctly. Because God desires his people rather to rend their or desires his people rather to rend their hearts, not just their garments. It is not meant to be an external display of your repentance or your mourning. While that comes along with it, if there is not an internal repentance of your heart, then you've done nothing. So more importantly than the external event of tearing your clothes is that your very heart be torn. God desires that our heart be broken hearted over sin and over the grief that we have caused because of it. What happens is that this often falls into this legalism. Legalism exalts the law above grace and it often arises as an overreaction against, as I shared earlier, antinomianism, which is which is basically the belief that would deny the significance of the law, which I think is also a very dangerous thing. And you've heard me say it many, many times, and I'll continue to say it, that extremes in either direction are not good. So legalism is doing what you should without the beat of your heart in it. And antinomianism is not doing what you claim your heart beats for saying, I believe in this, or I think we should do this, but not actually doing it. Neither of the two genuinely includes the heart in the matter. See, that is the difference between regret and genuine sorrow. It's the difference between being sad about the consequences you receive, but not about how sin has damaged one's fellowship with God. As important as outward conformity to worship might be, the condition of the heart is of greater importance to God. In fact, Hosea 6.6 6 says this, for I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. This has always been the case. God did not give the Jewish people a law to follow because if you do these things, then you're You're good. And it shows that you're genuine. But rather the call has always been, if you are genuine, you will do these things. Because your heart has been torn. So the call to return here was a call to repentance. 
Repentance actually means, quite literally, to change one's mind on a thing. So Joel gives actually the grounds for repentance, why it is that we should be repentant, why our minds should change about sin and about these events that are taking place. Joel shares that God is a God of grace and mercy. He has compassion for those in need. He is a God of love who has revealed himself to man in acts of redemptive grace. He is slow to anger. He is concerned for man's spiritual welfare. He is forgiving in that when man repents, God relents from sending calamity. God might even, as he shares, God might even restore the forfeited blessings and fertility of the land so that the discontinued sacrifices might again be offered but this time out of a pure heart. Remember last week we looked at there was the, the offerings and the sacrifices had stopped in Judah. And the reason why is because there was no grain for any grain offerings. There was no wine for any drink offerings because again, the locusts destroyed all of those things. And there were no animals even to offer for the, 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 sacrifice, the sacrifices and the animal offerings or anything like that because without the grain, the animals had no food. Without any food, the animals died. And all of this was a terrible thing because the very act that they, they used in their relationship with God in order to relate to him and to, to bless him with, with their sacrifices and offerings turned into an inability. They, they couldn't even physically worship God in the way that they desired to. And Joel says that our repentance, it doesn't mean that everything's going to turn around and be fine but maybe because your God is a loving God who relents over the disaster, maybe he'll bring back the fruit. Maybe he'll bring back the grain and he'll permit you to, to offer those sacrifices this time, but, but this time, not out of the legalism that you were living in, but from a pure heart, one that truly desires to give these sacrifices and these offerings to God because you are torn over your sin. If repentance is the changing of one's mind, then what would naturally follow, naturally follow is this. The changing of one's mind results in the changing of one's ways. Which is why there is no such thing as a carnal Christian. Because if you have truly repented and you have turned your life over to Christ, guess what? It means that you have changed. There does not still reside this, this desire to continue far from God because your mind has been changed. You've been transformed. So Joel calls again for an assembly. All were to come, from the elders and the spiritual leaders of the nation of Judah all the way to nursing infants and babies. You think, well, what good does this have to do with them? Everything. They're the most defenseless out of all of them. All must meet with God, listen to his commandments and act on them, as was not just their responsibility, but their privilege to do so. As God's chosen people, Joel admonished the people to pray, especially the priests who were meant to be the spiritual heads of the people. This is why the accountability of, of your spiritual leaders and, and elders or, or overseers of the church, is, is, there's so much of responsibility that's placed on them because they are guiding and leading the flock in the same way that the priests, it was their duty to guide and lead the people of Judah. And if they failed and they were doing wrong by that, there was a greater responsibility and accountability that was held on them. This is why the call to pastoral ministry that Paul gives to Timothy is so severe, and I don't think it's often talked about enough. It is not just another job. It is not something you flippantly do because you think, this might be fun. In fact, the wording that is used is that if, 
an overseer desires, if one desires to be an overseer, that word desire is actually the word for lust. The intensity of that needs to be there. As was it for the priests because they're held to a higher standard. Imploring the God of all grace to spare his people is what Joel called them and admonished them to pray for. Not only for their good, but that, is, that, that his inheritance might not be a reproach before the world or his name be brought into disre- disrepute because of what Judah had done. The same point was actually made by Moses in Exodus 32. Verse 11, it says this, but Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and consume consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Moses is making the same cry as Joel was making here. on behalf of the people pleading with God, relent from this disaster. May we turn back to you because we've been a reproach to your name. It's almost imploring God to to change the hearts of the people himself so that they might properly represent him as the Almighty. When people repent, God relents. There is coming a time when God will utter his voice and the day of judgment will come. And the only way, church, that you can be prepared for that day is if you are covered by the blood of Jesus. Doesn't matter how many bunkers you've got. It doesn't matter how many guns you've stored up. Because as the wrath of God has shown, it will plow through any weapons or any defenses that there are. The preparation that's done is done through faith in Christ. Because on that cross, he took the full wrath of God already. So that you wouldn't have to. Frank Gabling writes this, like his contemporaries, Joel emphasized the need to turn to God in true repentance and in total reliance on the God of all mercies, turning from their past iniquities and recognizing that the repentant heart is the only soil in which the regenerated soul can grow. Repentance is a gift that is actually given to you by God. Proof that one's softened heart has been tilled by God's grace to stir up a changing of mind and direction in life and without it there is no hope to avoid the coming judgment. Unless you believe in Christ, in his life, in his death, in his burial, and in his resurrection, in his victory over sin and death as he covered you and took your punishment Unless you believe all of that in the forgiveness of your sins through faith, in his work bringing to you repentance, then the only thing else you have to look forward to, if that is not the case, is a fearful expectation of judgment. And devastation of the wrath of an almighty God. Church, it would be unloving for me not to tell you this. It would be unloving for me not to tell you that there is a 
a day of the Lord that is coming. And if you are outside of Christ, you'll be caught in the destruction that comes. It's just as unloving for me to not share that as it would be to share with you that there is grace and there is peace and there is mercy at the foot of the cross. That Jesus has taken the sins upon himself and has been nailed to that tree so that the wrath of God does not fall on you but it fell on him for your sake. And that there is joy that comes in the midst of all of that. Will you be prepared and what will your response be? So I go back to thinking about the, the video of the, the woman and, and the ridiculousness of, of turning the lampshade, which actually was more work to turn the shade around than it was to just hit the button and turn off the light, which is the ironic part. But she did it with such intentionality I understand that there may be a a drip of legalism that is in that, but at the same time, if our hearts were that dedicated, what would our lives look like? And so here's my challenge for you this morning, church. Return to what you have neglected. This is what I mean by that, because I'm sure we've all been there. Our time with our God has become stale, stagnant or ritualistic and we seem to have lost our first love. Return to him. Repent from your slipping into bouts of legalism and revive an area where you have lost touch with your deep longing for God. Maybe it's this is in a, a dwindling prayer time or a prayer time where you spend 30, 40 minutes and yet nothing is said because all it is is empty words that are heaped on top of each other because our mind and our heart are not aligned in it. Maybe it's in your reading of the word of God that has become just another box to check off for the day. Maybe it's in an area of service or a job that you have been chosen to perform but you do it with lethargic and lackluster attitude and apathy instead of with joy that comes from doing all things well for the sake of Christ. Whatever it is, return to what you have neglected. Return to your God. Seek him and rend not your garments, but rend your hearts, church, because he loves you and he cares for you and he desires the best for you. Pray with me. Father, as we reflect on the intensity of the call to repent, God, I pray that we're broken hearted I pray that our grief is real and not just external, not just for show, but genuinely we are cut to the heart much like those at Pentecost were when they heard the word of God proclaimed. God, that the response would be the same from us, what then shall we do? God, I pray we would would answer Likewise, as Peter did, repent. Repent. Turn back to you. To change our mind on the issue of sin. And God, that we would seek your face even more diligently. That we would take every thought captive that every action and word that is spoken is not idly done. But Lord, that you would make us intentional with our lives and with our attitudes towards you.
Lord, let us echo the turning towards and the repentance that Joel was calling the people of Judah to in our own lives, in our own family. And may it make us stand out and different in this world. And may we be pleasing and honoring and glorifying to you. We pray these things in your glorious and wonderful name. Amen.